Welcome to this Global Middle East seminar on Pan-Arabism, the path to unity or division with Dr. Juan Romero. The Global Middle East seminar, GMES, as we like to uh, call it, uh, is a collaboration between Bill Kent University's Russian Studies Center um, and the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. Uh, a session, a seminar series that's designed to highlight new findings and perspectives on the Middle East, especially the region's recent international past. My thanks go um, to our partners at Bill Kent University, represented here by Professor Liza Gheorghe, um, but I should also uh, express my thanks to uh, Professors Honor Ishii and Sam Hurst, who have been just terrific collaborators uh, over the past uh, year in pulling off um, this session uh, as a way for us to bridge uh, the pandemic and stay in conversation with each other and with what we hope is a growing network of uh, uh, scholars, researchers, archivists, uh, and others, journalists and others in the region um, that, we're, uh, that we'd like to build um, as we explore the region's, um, the Middle East's um, uh, past uh, and, and history. Um, my thanks also to Kian Byrne uh, of the um, Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. He coordinates uh, the Middle East work at our end. Um, and so thank you, Kian. Let me, before I introduce our keynote speaker, uh, give uh, Professor Gheorghe a brief, um, brief opportunity to uh, welcome you on behalf, welcome, uh, say some words of welcome on behalf of uh, Bill Kent University. Eliza. Uh, thank you very much, Christian. Can you hear me okay? Is the connection stable? Yeah. Great. Um, so it's an honor to host Professor Juan Romero today and to have uh, his insights and learn from his scholarship on a very timely topic, that of Pan-Arabism, uh, something that uh, in, here in Turkey is on uh, a lot of people's minds. So um, I would like to thank him and also the Wilder Wilson Center for inviting him and for co-organizing this event with us uh, on behalf of my colleagues, Honor Ishchi and Sam Hurst. Um, I would like to express a, a deep, our deep gratitude for having 12 successful events so far, uh, and we're looking forward to um, our collaboration to flourish and to blossom in the years ahead, hopefully uh, more so in person than virtually, but uh, in the absence of that, uh, we are excited to be here and to co-host this event today. Uh, Professor Romero, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Thanks, Eliza. Um, just a quick note, uh, hopefully we'll have just a little bit of time at the end for some question and uh, comments. You can join the conversation then uh, in two ways. You can use the raise hand function in the Zoom functionality and you'll be queued and called upon uh, to uh, pose your question or, or comment, or you can also uh, put a question or comment in the Q&A um, functionality and post your, your question or comment and I'll put it to uh, our featured speaker. And with that, let me get to our featured speaker, um, Professor uh, Juan Romero, uh, who is Associate Professor at Western Kentucky University. Uh, Dr. Romero received his PhD from uh, the University of Texas, Austin in 2008. His research centers on several topics related to to, the nationalism, to nationalism in the Middle East, including revolutionary movements in the region, issues of Western imperialism, Pan-Arabism, and the Cold War in the Middle East. His book, The Iraqi Revolution of 1958, A Revolutionary Quest for Unity and Security, was published by University Press of America in 2011. He is just out uh, last month uh, with a new book um, uh, Terrorism, the Power and Weakness of Fear, published uh, in April 2022. Today, however, he will speak about Pan-Arabism, a path to unity and division. We very much look forward 
uh, to your presentation and thank you for joining. Welcome to GMES, Professor Romero. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the Woodrow Wilson Center and uh, Bill Kent University for uh, organizing this event and for inviting me to uh, give a presentation on Pan-Arabism. Um, so uh, the title of this uh, presentation is Pan-Arabism, a path uh, to unity or division. Um, this presentation examines the concept of Arab unity in the period uh, 1952 to 1970, focusing on the ideology of Pan-Arabism. Uh, there appears to be a consensus in the scholarly community that uh, Arab nationalism has its origins in the 20th century, in the early 20th century. Uh, however, uh, the reason for the focus on a period 50 to 70 years later um, is the actual experiments in Arab unity, which produced two uh, unity states in February of 1958, uh, the United Arab Republic and uh, the Arab Union. Uh, the proclamations and constitutions of these states and the revolutionary uh, regime of Iraq clearly reflect the tension uh, between them as a result of ideological differences uh, between revolutionary and uh, monarchic regimes in the Arab world. Ironically, following the overthrow of the Iraqi monarchy on July 14, 1958, uh, relations between the two revolutionary states uh, of the United Arab Republic and uh, Iraq turned out differently than what one might have expected, uh, since they deteriorated to a degree not experienced even under the monarchic regime in Baghdad prior to the Iraqi revolution. In this presentation, I will discuss to what extent the concept of Wahda Arabiya, that is Arab unity, pan-Arabism, uh, represented a unified approach to the realization of the dream of an Arab superstate. My examination of German, American, and British documents, Lebanese newspapers, uh, and memoirs of diplomats, military officers, and politicians uh, have led me to conclude uh, that the practical implementation of pan-Arab ideas actually caused division in the Arab world instead of unity. In this presentation, I will initially discuss three different interpretations of Arab unity, pan-Arabism, uh, Egyptian Syrian unity, monarchic Iraqi Jordanian unity, and the Iraqi revolutionary regime's interpretation of pan-Arabism. Following this discussion, I will examine to what extent uh, these interpretations of Arab unity are reflected in the proclamations and constitutions of different regimes, and finally, briefly discuss the possibility uh, of future Arab unity. The two decades under discussion constituted a turbulent era uh, with Arab revolutionaries ridding their countries of Western control, uh, Western powers attempting to retain uh, military, political, and economic uh, influence, the Soviet Union making efforts to gain inroads in the Middle East at the expense of Western powers, and Israel, by its mere existence, to a certain extent contributing to uh, the dissemination of pan-Arab ideas. Interestingly, Israel's de uh, declaration of independence on May 14, 1948, allowed Arab regimes somewhat to transcend ideological divisions and adopt a unified stance on the Israel-Palestine issue, as testified during the Suez Crisis of 1956, that when Arab regimes, republics, as well as monarchies, uh, condemned Israeli aggression against Egypt and adopted measures to sanction Great Britain and France. Interpretations of Pan-Arabism. There was a time when a consensus on the realization of Arab unity appears to have existed between revolutionary uh, Egyptian and monarchic Iraqi leaders. However, this anomaly lasted nearly for a brief period in the mid-1950s. In a meeting between the Egyptian Prime Minister, later President Gamal Abdul Nasser, and the Iraqi Prime Minister Fadil al-Jamali in January 1954, uh, the two leaders had discussed Arab unity. According to al-Jamali, 
he had proposed that a single federation of Arab states be completed in three stages, with the first phase involving unification of Iraq, Jordan, and Syria. The second stage would focus on unification of Egypt, Sudan, and Libya. And the final phase of Arab unity would be completed with the unification of Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Al Jamali had further proposed the Arab states unified, sorry, that Arab states unified policies in a number of areas, such as finance, foreign affairs, defense, and education, a plan of which Al Nasser had expressed approval. Uh, you have probably already noticed that several Arab states were not part of this plan. The omission of other Arab states can most likely be explained by the fact that they were still controlled by European powers in 1954. Soon after Al Nasser and uh, Al Jamali's meeting, Egypt and Iraq parted ways over the interpretation of Arab unity. When Iraq, as the only Arab country, acceded to the Baghdad Pact, in February of 1955. The Iraqi decision was unacceptable to al-Nasser whose interpretation of pan-Arabism aimed at reducing the influence of extra-regional powers in the Middle East. By contrast, the Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Said believed that an alliance with the West was the only way to ensure containment of the Soviet Union and defense of Arab countries. He did thus not see a contradiction between pan-Arabism and accession to the Baghdad Pact, a conviction which radically increased uh, tensions between Egyptian and Iraqi leaders. The Suez crisis of the following year undermined Nouri's argument and confirmed al Nasser's position that the Soviet Union did not pose a threat or a major threat to Arab countries and that Britain, France, and Israel constituted the real threat. Two important pan-Arab thinkers uh, need briefly to be introduced uh, in our discussion here. Uh, Abu Khaldun uh, Safi al-Husri. Um, he was a prominent 20th century pan-Arabist and uh, he argued in his works that Arabs need to form a single union state or nation state since they speak the same language. Uh, the other uh, pan-Arab thinker uh, is Michel Aflat, um, and he was an Orthodox Christian, a Syrian, and the founder of the Ba'ath Party. Uh, and he emphasized the importance of Islam for the success of the project uh, of Arab unity. So I obviously need to skip over some stuff here because uh, we uh, only have less than one hour. So I'll uh, proceed uh, with the next um, caption here, which is, uh, or heading, Egyptian-Syrian unity. In Egypt and Syria, the primary champions of Arab unity in the 1950s uh, were the Egyptian president, Gamal Abdel Nasser, and the Syrian Ba'ath Party, with its strong support among Syrian military officers. However, as early as 1905, Nagib Azouri, uh, a Syrian Christian, had presented a plan for an Arab unity state stretching from Iraq to uh, Egypt. 46 years later, in 1951, Syrian pan-Arabs had called for an Arab League uh, plan to implement Arab unity, the so-called Al-Qudsi plan, uh, the goal of which was to unite all Arab states in a full union. The central role uh, the idea of Arab unity occupied in Syrian politics in the early 1950s is demonstrated by the inclusion of pan-Arabism as a concept in the Syrian uh, constitution. Judging by demonstrations in the Arab world in support of the nationalization of the Suez Canal Company and against the Anglo-French-Israeli attack on Egypt in 1956, uh, one can conclude that these events served as uh, issues that Arab youth in particular could rally around and as a result contributed to Arab unity. Fearing fragmentation of the Syrian state and in reaction to the perceived threat of a communist takeover uh, in the country and international threats, military officers and the Ba'ath Party viewed union with Egypt as a panacea for serious problems. 
in consequence, the idea of Wahda Fawriya, that is immediate union, was embraced by military leaders in Syria. A delegation of military officers uh, flew to Cairo in January of 1958 uh, to discuss the matter uh, with Al Nasser without first informing their own government. The Egyptian president was initially reluctant to agree to a union, but eventually uh, relented when the officers explained the serious situation in Syria and as a last resort expressed doubts about Al Nasser's commitment to Arab unity. The latter approach proved effective and the Egyptian leader agreed to a Syrian-Egyptian merger, but on his own terms only. Syrian-Egyptian unity turned out to come at a very high price. Al Nasser demanded that all political parties be dissolved in Syria, and that the Syrian military and all, end all political activities. The Egyptian president's initial reluctance to accept the Syrian offer suggests uh, that he must have realized the enormity of the task before him and therefore insisted on being granted full powers to implement his unity policies without the distraction of having to consider opposition. Al Nasser's misgivings about the unity project were conformed, confirmed by the short lifespan of the union, a mere three years. In September 1961, leading Syrian circles had a change, of, a change of heart regarding the union and seceded unilaterally. An important reason for the secession was the Syrian perception that the country had been turned into a colony ruled by Egyptian officials. Al Nasser had replaced high ranking Syrian officials with his own people and moved the former to posts in Egypt where he could better control their activities. Reactions to the Syrian-Egyptian Union. Unlike Al Nasser's initial position on the Union, the Syrian and Egyptian people um, actually were very supportive of the unity project. This enthusiasm was also obvious in certain Iraqi and Lebanese newspapers and intellectual circles. However, support for the Union was most likely not widespread among Iraqi minorities and the Shi'i uh, majority due to fears that an increase Sunni majority would make them even more marginalized. Not surprisingly, reactions in conservative Arab states to the proclamation of the United Arab Republic were negative as well. Uh, Jordanian leaders were concerned about the propaganda victory uh, which Al Nasser had won and feared that the union would pose a threat to the country's national security. In Baghdad, uh, the news of the proclamation of the UAR was received with alarm. Crown Prince Abdulillah feared that the Syrian-Egyptian Union would expose Iraq to communist infiltration from Syria. The American Secretary of State John Foster Dulles uh, concurred in the Iraqi uh, Crown, Prince, uh, Crown Prince's assessment, arguing that the UAR was a communist plot, which would eventually lead to Soviet control over Arab states. Likewise, the Baghdad Pact had adopted a negative stance in January of 1958 on the possibility of a Syrian-Egyptian Union, uh, vowing to support opposition within Syria to a merger. For obvious reasons, Israel was alarmed uh, as well at the prospect of having to face a united enemy on two fronts, north and south. Finally, according to Al-Nasser, uh, the Saudi ruler, King Saud uh, bin Abdulaziz, had conspired to have him assassinated in order to prevent the union from becoming a reality. Iraqi Jordanian unity. Scholars such as Adi Dawisha, Charles Tripp, Phoebe Marr, and Riva Simon have only briefly discussed the Arab Union in their works, arguing that the Iraqi Jordanian merger in a federation was a mere result of the preceding proclamation of the Syrian Egyptian unity state. My own research has revealed that the proclamation of the United Arab Republic was indeed an important reason for the formation of the rival Iraqi Jordanian Arab Unity, uh, Arab Union, uh, two weeks later on February 14, 1958. However, this experiment in Arab Unity had been preceded by the fertile crescent concept, an Iraqi project.
Lebanon, and Palestine for various reasons, one of which was regime change in Syria. Uh, Iraqi unity efforts, which preceded those of Egypt, did not bear fruit until 1958. In its propaganda war with the United Arab Republic, the monarchic regime in Baghdad drew upon the Great Arab Revolt of 1916 to 18, launched by Sharif Hossein of Mecca, whose descendant, Faisal II, ruled Iraq, as evidence that the Arab Union represented true pan-Arabism, since it predated al Nasser's interpretation of this ideology by several decades. The reference to the Great Arab Revolt does not strengthen the case made by Iraq's Hashemite uh, dynasty because Sharif Hussein's primary objective appears to have been pan-Islamic more than pan-Arab, an argument which is supported by the fact that he declared himself caliph. Immediately after the proclamation of the Iraqi Jordanian uh, Arab Union on February 14, uh, the British ambassador to Jordan, Charles Johnston, uh, reported in a diplomatic communication to London that the link of the great, uh, to the Great Arab Revolt of 1916 uh, to 18 should make a powerful appeal to public opinion, unquote. Irrespective of whether Sharif Hussein had caliphal um, aspirations, a successful outcome of Anglo-Arab negotiations of, in 1916 could have resulted in an Arab superstate uh, encompassing the Arab uh, Arabian Peninsula and greater Syria and Iraq, had Sharif Hussein been able to persuade the British to make a clear commitment to accept uh, the Hashemite leader's territorial boundaries, as delineated in the so-called Hussein Makmaun uh, correspondence prior to uh, the Great Arab Revolt in 1916. A few years later, the Sharif's son, Emir Abdullah of Transjordan, uh, developed his own plan for an Arab unity state, which would encompass Transjordan, the French mandates for Syria and Lebanon, and Britain's mandate for Palestine. The realization of this project had failed, however, uh, due to British, uh, British opposition, opposition to an attack on the French, who had by then ejected Abdullah's brother Faisal uh, from Syria. Unlike the state envisioned by Sharif Hussein, the Fertile Crescent Project, and later uh, the Arab Union, the former of the two particularly promoted by the Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Said, uh, was like uh, the United uh, Arab Republic based upon a political ideology. Uh, this project left the door open to accession of other Arab states. The Iraqi Prime Minister appears to have considered resorting to force to realize this project. The fact that Nouri was prepared to apply coercion to realize his plan demonstrates the importance attributed to uh, serious participation in the United States. Interestingly enough, a British Foreign Office memorandum uh, reveals that the British government would not oppose the use of force to achieve an Iraqi-Syrian merger if the Syrian Communist Party were close to establishing control over the country. Unlike the British position uh, on uh, an Iraqi-Syrian union, London had consistently adopted a negative position on an Iraqi-Jordanian union until 1957, or at least the beginning of 1958, when the British had begun to promote the idea in Amman and Baghdad. Uh, the change of heart in London was evident in a communication from the British ambassador to Jordan, Charles Johnston. He found it satisfactory that the first real step towards Arab unity should have been taken on a pro-Western basis, end of quote. It's quite possible that the change position was the result of the Suez crisis of 1956 and British efforts to launch a diplomatic comeback in the Middle East and reverse the negative fallout of the 1956 debacle. Another seeming anomaly in British policy toward the Arab world was the British support for the formation of the League of Arab States in March of 1945. British flexibility on this issue can most likely be explained as a realization that opposition would lead to a considerable reduction in British influence in the region. London quite possibly calculated that support for the League would ensure uh, a continued British role in the Middle East 
albeit a reduced one on account of different agendas um, of the Arab states. The 1950s uh, were a decade of political turbulence in both Iraq and Jordan. The pro-West monarchic regime in Amman had to contend with a strident pan-Arab and anti-West propaganda disseminated by the Cairo-based radio station Salt al -Arab. King Hussein found it difficult to neutralize Egyptian uh, propaganda because of the fact that a British officer, John Bagot Club, was the commander of the Jordanian Arab Legion. And the anti-Zionist sentiments among Palestinians in the West Bank, uh, which was part of Jordan at the time. In consequence of these vulnerabilities, the king had to make concessions, resulting in the dismissal of Glove and the appointment of a pro-Egyptian prime minister, Suleiman and Nabulsi, in 1956. To the chagrin of King Hossein, Al-Nabulsi uh, was bold enough to call for a federation with Egypt and Syria the same year. The king's dismissal of the popular prime minister caused widespread unrest in the country. Simultaneously, Iraq's pro-West policies caused widespread unrest in the country over the course of the decade as a result of a proposed military alliance with Britain in 1948. Iraq's accession uh, to the Baghdad Pact in 1955 and demonstrations against the Anglo-French-Israeli attack on Egypt in 1956. Eventually, the regime was compelled uh, to call in the army to deal with the opposition to its policies. Soon after the proclamation of the Arab Union on February 14, 1958, it became obvious that relations between the two pan-Arab states would not remain amicable, despite uh, an initial congratulatory uh, telegram from President Al Nasser to King Faisal II. Relations between the two pan-Arab uh, entities quickly turned contentious and even hostile uh, for propagandistic reasons. Uh, the race to attract other Arab states to accede to the unions became a strategic necessity since new accessions would be perceived as a victory over the other entity. Another point which is worth mentioning is the fact that traditional scholarship has argued that the Arab Union was a direct result of the proclamation of the United Arab Republic. The above discussion and my own research have revealed that this is true only to the extent that the Arab Union was proclaimed at that particular point in time. Uh, since various unity projects predating the UAR, had been presented both by Amman and Baghdad. Reactions to the proclamation of the Arab Union. Uh, reactions to the proclamation of the Arab Unions uh, were mixed. In uh, the Jordanian East Bank, the unity project was uh, greeted with a certain amount uh, of support, whereas the Palestinian population in the West Bank was much less enthusiastic. In Baghdad, the proclamation of uh, the Iraqi uh, Jordanian unity state prompted fears that it would negatively affect Iraq's economy. In the Saudi press, the coverage of the proclamation of the Arab Union figured more prominently than that of the United Arab Republic. The Israeli press expressed similar concerns to those reported at uh, the proclamation of uh, the uh, UAR, uh, namely that Iraqi troops could possibly be deployed to the Israeli-Jordanian border in the future. The proclamation of the United Arab Republic. This is a short document which claims to reflect the will of the Arab people. The proclamation states that the people of the United Arab Republic will have an opportunity within 30 days to express their will in plebiscite and elect a head of state. Accession to the union is open to all Arab states and the proclamation appeals to God to watch over the first step toward Arab unity to enable the Arab people to live in dignity. The reference uh, to the Arab people's will in the proclamation suggests that the Syrian president Shukri al Kuwatli and the Egyptian president Gamal Abdel Nasser had fulfilled the wish of all Arabs. It's difficult to think of a more powerful way to legitimize this unity project. If its leaders speak for all Arabs, the corollary is that they also act in the interest uh, of all Arabs. 
The purpose is to create an incentive for other Arab states to accede to the union and to encourage Arabs to put pressure on regimes unwilling to do so. Uh, the reference uh, to the Arab Ummah nation in the proclamation is a clever attempt to elicit an emotive response because of the powerful uh, connotations the term has in the Arab world. It's clear to any reader that the proclamation is infused with a heavy dose of pan-Arabism, a dream which has now become a reality. The mentioning of hostile forces is a clear signal to the reader that the target is Western imperialism as reflected in the Baghdad Pact and the recent Suez Crisis, 1955 and 1956 respectively. The proclamation should thus be interpreted as a victory over these hostile forces, uh, the objective of which presumably is to prevent Arab unity. The proclamation highlights the democratic and religious character of the Arab unity project. It states that the United Arab Republic will be based upon a presidential democratic system of government and that citizens will enjoy equal rights without, however, being specific about these rights. Furthermore, the promise to hold a plebiscite allowing Syrians and Egyptians to express their opinion of the merger of the two countries suggests that the leadership wishes to ensure uh, the support of the population and that the Egyptian and Syrian presidents are committed to a democratic political process in the union. Finally, the call upon God to protect the union serves to reassure citizens that their spiritual needs will be met in the UAR and that the project is legitimized by the highest authority, God. The critical reader will notice the lack of specificity with respect to potential problems, such as the location of a hostile power, that is Israel, separating the two entities of the UAR and the two different economic systems in Syria and Egypt, market economy in the former and Arab socialism in the latter. In summary, the language of the document suggests that the purpose is to evoke an emotive response and not to present a detailed approach to Arab unity. Like the proclamation examined above, uh, the 1958 Provisional Constitution of the United Arab Republic makes only vague references to citizens' rights, and the word democratic is found only once in the document. Furthermore, the democratic deficit is obvious from the statement that a minimum of half of the UAR's National Assembly must be members of the Syrian Chamber uh, of Deputies and Egypt's National Assembly. The provisional constitution does not state that 50% of the Republic's National Assembly must be composed of Syrian deputies. Also, the document states that Cairo will be the seat of the Republic's National Assembly, reinforcing the impression that Egypt will be the dominant power in the Union. This suspicion is also confirmed by the statement in uh, the proclamation that the Egyptian and Syrian people will elect a president of the UAR. Uh, UAR. Gamal Abdel Nasser's uh, popularity made it pretty much a foregone conclusion that he would be elected president. Based upon the wording of the proclamation and the provisional constitution, one can thus draw the conclusion that the domestic and regional situation, pan-Arabism and military pacts have influenced the framing of the two documents. They also reveal that the future leaders have merely paid lip service to the concept of democracy. The constitution of the Iraqi Jordanian Arab Union. The very first article of the constitution underscores the rivalry between the United Arab Republic and the Arab Union. Like the UAR document, the Arab Union constitution states that the union is open for accession to all Arab states. The prominent position of this statement in Article 1 of the Constitution demonstrates the importance attributed to an expansion of the Arab Union. Future accessions uh, to, the Arab, uh, to the Union would increase the possibility of the Iraqi-Jordanian Union winning the propaganda war against the UAR, thus avoiding the risk of marginalization should the opposite side expand first. Furthermore, 
accessions of other Arab states, such as Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, uh, which like Iraq and Jordan were monarchies, would increase the prospect of a balanced union budget. As a result, it was of great importance to include incentives in the constitution, which would serve to make the union more appealing for accession than the UAR documents. An example of such an incentive is the statement that each member state will remain its current, uh, will retain its current system of government and international status, and that previously concluded treaties will only be valid in the member state that is party to such treaties. The latter example made it possible for Jordan to accede to the Union uh, without having to accede to the Baghdad Pact, of which Iraq was a member. Unlike the UAR documents, Article 2 of the Arab Union Constitution states that each member state retains its system of government, including the economic system. By contrast, Article 4 of the UAR Provisional Constitution imposes Egypt's planned economy on serious market economy. The examination of the UAR and Arab Union documents above reveals that domestic and regional political and economic developments influenced the documents under discussion. The influence of each member state is given much attention in the Iraqi Jordanian constitution and uh, less so in the Syrian Egyptian documents, uh, whereas the freedom of citizens appear uh, to be less restricted in the UAR than in the Arab Union. In both unity states, the head of the senior, uh, of the senior uh, partner, Egypt and Iraq, is also the head of uh, the unity state. Having said that, in the UAR, the president is elected, whereas the position is hereditary in the Iraqi Jordanian Union as a result of the monarchic system of government. To all appearances, this suggests a democratic advantage in the UAR over the Arab Union. However, the Arab Union Constitution states that the position of head of state can be reconsidered in the case of new accessions, a possibility uh, which would most likely not be entertained by al Nasser, who has made sure that he has been granted exclusive powers to formulate policies. Unlike the UAR Provisional Constitution, Article 10 of the Iraqi Jordanian Constitution grants both member states equal influence in the, unit, in the Union Council, 20 Iraqi members and 20 Jordanian members, and its citizens, all freedoms guaranteed by the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights. A qualifying provision stating in accordance with current laws reveals that the guarantee is too good to be true, since Arab Union law essentially invalidates the UN Declaration particularly in Iraq. A somewhat unusual arrangement to maintain the idea of equality is the stipulation that the seat of government must alternate between Baghdad and Amman every six months. This stipulation would seem even more impractical if other states were to accede to the Arab Union, but it's possible that the two governments believe this arrangement would reassure potential uh, new member states of their equal influence in the Union. Uh, let's take a quick look at the Iraqi uh, revolutionary state. Uh, following the Iraqi revolution of July 14, 1958, the country withdrew from the Arab Union. The revolutionary regime focused on domestic policies, um, contrary to the demands of the uh, Iraqi Ba'athists for Wahda Fawriya, immediate accession to the UAR. Despite this fact, the new uh, regime's interpretation of Arab unity is of interest for our discussion here, since it constitutes a form of pan-Arabism uh, different from that of the UAR and Arab Union. The leader of the revolutionary regime, uh, Brigadier Abdul Karim Qasim, uh, promoted what can best be described as a hybrid form of pan-Arabism, insisting on full control over domestic policies. From this, one can draw the conclusion that Qasim had no appetite for playing second fiddle uh, to al Nasser, uh, which uh, would be the case were Iraq to accede to the United Arab Republic. Qasim's position on Arab unity did, however, not exclude 
pan-Arab cooperation in certain areas, such as foreign policy, defense, and education. Proclamation number one emphasizes the role of the Iraqi people in assisting uh, the armed forces in toppling the monarchy. Like the UAR uh, proclamation, proclamation number one mentions God, arguing that divine intervention was a factor in the overthrow of the Ancien Regime. Uh, the purpose was most likely the same in both proclamations, namely to solicit uh, support from relig religious communities. Uh, the language of proclamation number one reflects the anti-imperialist and neutralist rhetoric of Arab nationalism at the time. Like uh, the UAR proclamation, the Iraqi proclamation states that the president will be elected, but fails to determine a date. Um, I think I will uh, skip the next paragraph here and uh, move uh, quickly to the conclusion. Um, so conclusion, does pan-Arab Arabism have a future? Uh, this brings us to the conclusion of uh, this presentation and the question of whether Arab unity has a future. Based upon our examination of different interpretations of Arab unity, pan-Arabism, and to what extent these were reflected in proclamations and constitutions, one can draw the conclusion that they explain why these documents radically differed from one another. Factors such as perceptions of Western policies toward Arab countries, uh, system of government, economic order, uh, defense policies, and the Cold War determined the different interpretations of pan-Arabism and caused deep divisions in the Arab world. An historical approach to the issue of Arab unity uh, reveals that pan-Arabism has benefited from the existence of issues around which Arabs can rally. Oftentimes, a crisis or a question generally perceived as a threat to Arab states. The fate of Palestine, for a long time such a unifying issue, began to lose its appeal to the Arab Ummah in the late 1970s. Uh, with peace between Egypt and Israel, later followed by Jordan and Israel in the 1990s, and more recently the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain's normalization of relations with Israel. Israel also served for a long time as an issue which induced some Arab states to wage war against this state in 1948, 1976, uh, 1967, and 1973, and strengthened Arab unity. A third example of an issue which reinforced pan-Arab sentiments in the Middle East is the Suez Crisis of 1956, which prompted anti-West and pro-Egypt demonstrations across the Arab world, catapulting Gamal Abdel Nasser, the foremost champion of pan-Arabism, to hero status in Arab societies. The Suez Crisis of 56 had negative consequences for the West since the crisis considerably undermined the argument that the Soviet Union constituted the main threat to the security of the Middle East. Uh, following the Islamic Revolution in Iran in 1979, radical Islam emerged as a serious challenger to pan-Arabism, with some extremist organizations such as Daesh or ISIS emphasizing pan-Islamism and the idea of establishing uh, the early Islamic Caliphate. But these developments have not necessarily spelled the demise of the concept of Arab unity. Uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council, a political and economic alliance of six countries, was formed in 1984. Until now, GCC has remained a regional organization, though it has remained open to membership of other Arab monarchies. The fact that all member states are ruled by monarchs, however, suggests that the organization embraces the concept of eklimiya, uh, regionalism, instead of pan-Arabism. It's worth mentioning, though, that even regional Arab unity is no stranger to discord and division, as testified to by the GCC imposition of sanctions on Qatar in 2017. Uh, so what is left of the ideal of Arab unity, which was once a powerful driving force in the Middle East politics? In addition to the organizations I mentioned above, um, which by the way, do not have a perfect record in the context of pan-Arabism, uh, one can mention the center of Center for Arab Unity Studies in Beirut. According to the center's website, 
this NGO and think tank carries out independent research in all aspects of Arab society and Arab unity. The center publishes books and uh, several academic journals promoting the concept of Arab unity and organizing uh, seminars, conferences, and webinars disseminating the ideals of Arab unity, also promoting democracy. The latter, an ideal, uh, as we have pointed out in this presentation, which has not figured prominently in pan-Arab discourses. Um, perhaps its inclusion in the center's activities will cause a revitalization of the idea of Arab unity in the future. Uh, the title of one of the journals published by the center, Al Mustaqbal Al Arabi, or Arab Future, uh, is an indication that the center believes in a role for pan Arabism in the future. That is all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Romero, for this um, very thoughtful, uh, detailed, and systematic review of um, pan Arab uh, projects, um, historical projects, and uh, uh, leading up to. to um, some of the present incarnations and efforts. Um, let me um, uh, remind our viewers, if you'd like in the remaining time and uh, remaining few minutes to, to chime in, you can do so by raising your hand um, uh, in the Zoom function or post a question to the Q&A um, uh, function also in Zoom. Um, but let me to, to start with um, Dr. Romero, ask if you could talk for a moment about, um, you've, you've You've very um, systematically worked us through uh, the, the various proclamations associated with the um, the uh, Panera pro Pan projects. Um, are there historical sources beyond the kind of published materials, uh, especially in the Middle East, that you have um, accessed? And what's you know, are there um, Arabic sources that you've accessed uh, for this research? Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, yes, uh, there definitely are uh, Arab uh, sources, and uh, these are uh, mostly memoirs. Uh, some of these memoirs written by um, uh, people who were involved uh, in these projects, uh, and uh, particularly by Lebanese. Uh, so I need to explain that uh, uh, civil war erupted in Lebanon in 1958. Uh, and uh, this civil war was uh, to a certain extent sponsored by uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser. Uh, so this was after the proclamation of uh, the United Arab uh, Republic. And uh, uh, these uh, sources are very informative. And so is the uh, Lebanese press at the time, which uh, was uh, free of censorship. So uh, Lebanese newspapers uh, such as Al Nahar and uh, Al Hayat are uh, really good sources uh, for uh, information on uh, Pan-Arabism and uh, the two projects. Um, also books have uh, been published in Jordan uh, on uh, the short-lived uh, Arab Union. Um, and uh, uh, I can provide uh, some more information uh, if anyone is interested uh, in that by uh, email. Um, and of course, uh, there are Western sources as well, but uh, there is a dearth of sources, Western sources on the Arab Union. Um, but uh, I published an uh, article in a British uh, journal uh, a few years ago, so uh, that would be one uh, source for the Arab Union. Thank you. Eliza? Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Romero. This was fascinating. Um, I've uh, long wondered um, about the origins of these political uh, political units. I don't even know what to call them because they're unions, but they sort of fall apart so easily. Um, I'm curious about uh, if there was a lot of unity or how, how would you describe the position of these countries on the Palestinians and how they treated the Palestinians differently? Was there really, can we really speak of um, Arab unity when it comes down, or pan-Arabism, when we think about um, the rights of Palestinians in Palestine and um, the Arab-Israeli conflict? Thank you, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, as I pointed out in the presentation, uh, Palestine uh, served, uh, at least initially, as uh, an issue that uh, 
Arab states uh, could rally around and that uh, promoted the idea of uh, pan-Arabism. Uh, but of course that changed overnight uh, with the uh, uh, Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty uh, in 1978, the Camp David Accords. Um, and uh, you know, from the Palestinian perspective, uh, it was perceived as a sellout uh, basically. Uh, but immediately after the uh, 1967 uh, war, which was a total debacle for uh, the Arab states, uh, there was a summit meeting in uh, Khartoum, uh, the Sudanese capital, uh, that, was, uh, that adopted uh, a resolution uh, that was called the Three No's. So uh, no recognition of Israel, no uh, relations with Israel, no peace treaty with Israel, no, um, no uh, uh, diplomatic um, relations uh, whatsoever. So uh, at least, uh, you know, following the 1967 war, yes, there was definitely an issue uh, that uh, the Arabs uh, could uh, adopt a uh, united position on, and that was Palestine. Uh, however, um, you know, I need to mention that the Palestinian uh, agenda did not necessarily uh, consistently coincide uh, with the agendas of Arabs, uh, Arab states, and uh, a result of this was uh, the uh, uh, formation of the uh, Palestine Liberation Organization in 1964. Uh, so the Palestinians, uh, you know, in those days uh, were obviously pretty much fed up with uh, the treatment uh, at the hands of their Arab uh, brothers, and uh, they took their fate into their own hands. Um, so that's a brief, uh, a brief answer to your question, but I think it's worth, definitely worth uh, a more uh, extensive uh, discussion. It's a really good question. Thank you. Um, uh, there's a question in the Q&A. Eliza, I don't know if you want to uh, respond to a question about Romania's attitude on, the, on these issues. That's not sure if, if that's uh, something um, uh, you're, you're, you'd like to respond to it at this moment. I'll give you time to think about it by just um, asking Dr. Romero um, if he could briefly um, uh, do two things. One is to... Um, just briefly covered the um, attitude of non-Arab countries in the region towards these pan-Arabic um, uh, 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 unity projects. Um, and more generally, um, if um, you could place your findings into a larger historiographical context, what is, what is your particular intervention um, in this debate on, um, on um, pan-Arabism. Uh, thank you for the questions. Uh, so the first uh, question, um, the perception of Western powers uh, of uh, pan-Arabism. Uh, well, the fear of Western powers, uh, particularly with regard to the proclamation of the United Arab uh, Republic, uh, was that uh, the Soviets would gain an inroad into uh, the Middle East as a result of this. So um, the United States and uh, Britain, uh, they uh, viewed uh, Gamal Abdel Nasser as a dangerous, uh, very popular uh, politician in the region, uh, not just because of um, his uh, uh, rigid uh, stance on uh, Israel, um, but uh, also because uh, of uh, uh, his, from a Western perspective, flirtations with uh, um, the Soviet bloc. Uh, so you've probably heard of the uh, Czech uh, arms um, deal of 1955, um, when um, the Soviet Union through uh, Czechoslovakia uh, transferred uh, arms to uh, Egypt. And uh, this uh, basically led to an arms race uh, in the Middle East. Um, so with regards to uh, the United Arab Republic, it's clear what the Western position was. Um, it's a dangerous development. And uh, um, the uh, remedy to this uh, was uh, the containment policy. Uh, so the Soviet Union needed to be contained and prevented from making any inroads into the Middle East. Uh, that was the US uh, agenda uh, at the time. Uh, now with regards to uh, the Arab Union, that was a completely different matter because 
uh, it was a pro-West Union, uh, and uh, Iraq, uh, which was still a monarchy, uh, was a member of the Baghdad Pact, uh, sponsored uh, by the West, and uh, also the British uh, um, were included in this uh, defense uh, pact. Uh, so uh, the view of uh, the Arab Union uh, was that uh, uh, Iraq needed to be uh, part of the Baghdad Pact uh, in order to prevent the Soviet Union from taking over the oil fields of the Middle East. Uh, and that, of course, raised a huge red flag uh, to uh, the Western powers and uh, led to um, strong support for the Arab Union. Uh, but uh, the Arab Union was uh, weak from the very uh, uh, outset because uh, the Iraqis um, would uh, uh, sponsor 80% of the budget uh, for the first year at least, with uh, the Jordanians uh, providing 20%. And that was, of course, an untenable uh, position. So that's why they made uh, efforts to include Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, uh, but uh, these two countries were not really interested in joining. Now, with uh, regards to your second question, my findings um, in um, a historical context here, uh, well, uh, what uh, characterizes my research is my conclusion uh, that uh, the Arab Union, which is almost uh, not studied at all in Western sources, uh, that it was uh, not uh, a direct result uh, of the proclamation of the United Arab Republic, which is uh, the traditional scholarly uh, conclusion. Uh, I uh, have argued instead uh, that uh, I could concede that it was a result and that it was uh, proclaimed at that particular moment, you know, merely two weeks after uh, the proclamation of the United Arab Republic. But as I pointed out in this uh, presentation as well. Um, many um, Pan-Arab projects uh, were uh, prepared uh, by uh, Jordan and Iraq in particular, and all these projects predated uh, the United uh, Arab Republic. So there's a long history uh, of uh, uh, these Pan-Arab uh, efforts uh, made by uh, Iraq and uh, Jordan. So uh, Egypt uh, joined uh, the competition uh, much uh, later, and uh, that probably goes back to uh, Egypt's uh, role uh, and perception of the Ottoman Empire, because uh, Egypt and Egyptians uh, regarded themselves as somewhat of uh, outsiders because of the British occupation in 1882 uh, of Egypt, and it basically lasted until 1956 when the last uh, British uh, soldier uh, was evacuated uh, from the Suez Canal Zone. Um, and some of these um, pan-Arab projects, they did not include Egypt either because Egypt was not considered uh, really part uh, of uh, the Arab world. Thank you. Um, we're coming up on the hour, but I want to give uh, Eliza any, any final words. Um, the question that was posed was interesting. I answered it very quickly in chat. I hope that's okay. Um, thank you for the interest in Romania and the Middle East. I think it's something very promising. But um, if I can say a few words just to thank Professor Romero for his talk. It was um, really fascinating and I'm sure our students have learned a lot and will come to their exams much better prepared to talk about Pan-Arabism. Um, and we hope to have the opportunity to host you in Turkey in person in the near future. So thank you very much for giving this fascinating presentation. Thank you very much, my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Eliza. Thanks, Dr. Romero. We're adjourned. Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Professor Romero. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Thank you all. Bye-bye.